Um, in terms of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the history, a bit about the composition of cement, uh, macroscopically, microscopically, how that structure affects its behavior and the properties um, of cement, both in the short and the uh, long term. And I need to credit Robin Ling and Clive Lee, uh, as well as Professor Tony Miles, who really have done a lot of experimentation over the years to understand how uh, bone cement interacts with um, implants and our understanding of it. When we talk about fixation of implants to bone, we really need to start with the Mr. C's Gluck, um, who was a, a, a Romanian-born uh, surgeon who actually uh, worked in uh, Leipzig and uh, Berlin, as well as Bucharest, and ended up in Berlin, where he did a lot of um, interesting research on uh, transplantation of tissues and then later fixation of implants and did the first ivory uh, knee replacement, did some ivory hemiarthroplasties as well. Uh, but he appreciated the fixation of the implant to the to the bone was key. Um, initially, an interference fit was used, but but they suffered with loosening. And he tried various uh, uh, components to try and attach the tissues to uh, the bone, as you can see uh, here. But this was in the 1890s, and it was probably another 50 years uh, before bone cement uh, was finally used in terms of fixation to implants. So what is bone cement? Well, it is not this stuff. This is what the Americans think bone cement is. They gave up cement many, many years ago because of what they thought was cement disease and they felt it was called osteolysis. But it is still thought to be concrete in certain parts of the Western world, which is a shame because it is a, a beautifully organic substance. Uh, it is a polymer. It's a polymer of methyl methacrylate or PMMA, also known as acrylic glass. And this gentleman on the picture on the right is Otto Rome, and again, a German, a chemist from the mid-19th century who, uh, in the 1930s, developed plexiglass. So he developed PMMA and made it with uh, glass, and that how it is how it was uh, sold. In England, it was marketed as Perspex. In America, they marketed it as Lucite. And as with many uh, inventions, it really took a war for it to find a clinical uh, application. Um, so the nose cones and the canopies of some of these fighter planes, uh, rather than being made of glass, they changed them to be made of perspex, which was lighter. Uh, and um, it, it was the uh, optics were much better. So when you look through curved perspex, it was much clearer than looking through um, clear glass. This is a gentleman called Harold Ridley, who was an English eye surgeon. And after the war, he took cement, uh, sorry, took the shrapnel, the pieces of foreign material in pilots' eyes that had become embedded in their eyes from when they were shot at through their canopies. And the pilots who had bits of glass in their eyes had a very aggressive foreign body reaction to that glass. The pilots who had perspex in their eyes had virtually no reaction at all. So he realized it was very well tolerated by the human body, and it took him on to make the first intraocular lenses uh, out of perspex. It was also, because of its biocompatibility, used by dentists as well uh, for making dental implants and fixation of dental implants. But it wasn't until John Charmley was looking for a substance to attach implants to bone that through his friendship with the dentists at the University of Manchester, he decided to try using a PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. So what is a, a polymer? Well, a polymer is simply a long chain of individual mer units or monomers, uh, and they're joined together in very long chains, many thousands of units. And those chains are joined together with electrostatic uh, van der Waals forces. What we know it as is a bag of polymer powder uh, and a bottle of liquid monomer. And within the powder, there are other additives that uh, make it visible on X-ray. So barium and zirconium are added to make it visible on X-ray. There's an initiator uh, and occasionally antibiotics or coloring are added. The bottle is a bottle of monomer. Uh, it has an inhibitor in it to stop it polymerizing. Uh, and there's also an activator as well for when the two are mixed together. And so this is a monomer of methyl methacrylate. And when you mix the liquid monomer with the polymer powder, uh, essentially the initiator overcomes the inhibitor and polymerization starts 
with the help of an activator. And you have this very long chain with free radicals at the end where more molecule, uh, monomer molecules are added and smaller chains join together to become larger and longer chains. It's an exothermic reaction, so it produces heat. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the temperature of the cement, the bone and the implant is raised, but the blood and the tissue remove some of that heat so that the local soft tissue damage is minimal at least. We need to understand something about the basic biomechanics of cement. So we'll talk about stress, strain, fatigue, and viscoelasticity, which is a concept of two phenomenon. One is creep and one is stress relaxation. And we'll talk about both of those. So you'll be familiar with this stress strain curve. And the important bit of that curve is the first part, the elastic part. And the gradient of this slope is called the Young's modulus. And every material will have a Young's modulus. And if you look at the Young's modulus of the materials commonly used in implant surgery, you will see that PMMA, or bone cement, has a very low modulus of elasticity, very similar to cancellous bone, very similar to polyethylene. So in the example of a, a cemented polyethylene socket, it acts as a very good stress modulator, transmitting the stress from the implant through the polymer into the bone very, very gently and very, very kindly. And the bottom line with these biomechanical short-term properties is that cement is weak in tension and shear, but it is very strong in compression with a low modulus of elasticity. And this is important to understand when we design implants to work with bone cement. We need to understand these properties. When we look at the long-term properties of bone cement, it's this viscoelasticity, these two phenomena of creep and stress relaxation. So here is a model of polymer, long chains uh, of MER units joined together with very strong bonds between the MER units. And then there are these weak van der Waals forces between the individual chains. So you can think of it like a bowl of spaghetti where the source is the, the weak secondary bonds between the chains of spaghetti. Now, if you apply a stress to a polymer, then what happens is that those spaghetti chains, they stretch out slightly. And this is what creep is. So this movement of the cement over time when you apply a load to it is as the chains are stretching and straightening out. And this is called creep. But you can see what's happened there is some of those forces between the chains have become stretched and their energy is increased. So as the material undergoes creep, the stress in the material goes up. And it's typically a tensile stress when bone cement is weak. But what happens if that stress is maintained, then those forces will revert. They will change to a lower energy state. They will lose energy and the stress will relax. So as long as you hold the material in a constant strain, yes, the stress increases with creep, but with time, it gradually reduces. And there have been experiments done looking at this. If you take a column of cement and you load it, over time, that cement will creep. And you can measure the rate of that creep over time. But the important thing is, is it changes over time. So creep is dependent upon the magnitude of the load, but also the length of time over which that load is applied. And here's an example of an experiment that Robin Ling and Clive Lee did. They took a metal model with grooves in, a cone of cement and a taper, and they loaded it in a sterile bath for several days. And here is the specimen uh, before the compression test. And here is the specimen after the compression test several days. And you can see how that cement has crept. It's flowed into the mold over time. In terms of stress relaxation, you can do another experiment where you take a bar of cement, you hold it between two clamps, you stretch that cement and you measure the stress within that cement. Measure shown by the yellow arrows here. You lock that in position and then if you measure the stress within that material over time, then gradually the stress will reduce as those bonds reform in a lower energy state. And this is stress relaxation. And all materials, all bone cements will undergo creep and they will all undergo stress relaxation. 
some more than others. You can see bone lock cement there was a, was a cement designed to be slightly safer than other cements, but the change in chemicals changed its um, mechanical properties and it underwent creep and stress relaxation much more than others. And with certain implants, it failed quite catastrophically. The other thing that we need to add in here as a long-term cement is this concept of fatigue. So every material will eventually fatigue and will fail. If you stress it through enough cycles above its endurance limit, then a material will fail. And cemented implants are loaded many thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. So why does the bone cement not fail? And fatigue failure is usually due to tensile stress, not compressive stress. And we know that bone cement is weak in tension. But stress relaxation is our protection mechanism here. If you take this example of a stem, you can see as the stem is loaded, this cross-sectional area of the stem increases in size. And in doing so, there are compressive elements across the cement in red, and there are hoop tensile forces. These are the ones that may cause fatigue failure with repetitive loading. But due to the stress relaxation, so when the bone is rested over periods of rest or at night, for example, due to the stress relaxation of cement, those forces are reduced. And therefore, the stress relaxation that occurs with cement is a self-protection against fatigue failure so that you can load cement multiple times over the life of a hip over many decades. But because of the rest periods, that cement will not fail. So there's a little bit about the history, a bit about the composition, how the structure affects that behavior, and then some of the long and the short-term properties we've discussed there. I hope that's cleared a few things up ahead of